Well, hello there, watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the journalist and broadcaster Jenny Kleeman, who joins me here in the studio, and the Financial Times' Whitehall editor, Lucy Fisher, who joins us down the line. Welcome to both of you. So, as ever, let's kick off with the front pages, starting with the Metro, which carries an estimate that the air traffic disruption could cost the British economy up to £80 million. The I reporting that UK airlines, who weren't themselves responsible for the breakdown, have been accused by passengers of abandoning them. According to The Sun, some Brits trapped abroad could be there for up to two weeks. And as bad as it's been, the Mail says there won't be a penny in compensation for those who have suffered. The Express, meanwhile, has news that Rishi Sunak is tearing up Brussels regulations to speed up the building of 100,000 new homes in the UK. The Guardian says the Commons Foreign Affairs Committee wants Britain to take a tougher stance with China over human rights abuses. The Financial Times reporting that the investment bank Goldman Sachs used Chinese state money it had in its possession to buy a number of British and American companies. And finally, the Daily Star exploding a popular myth by telling us that scientists are now certain that having a few drinks does not make us look more attractive to others. Are we sure? Anyway, uh, a reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out those front pages while you listen to our guests. So let's head straight to Lucy Fisher and Jenny Kleeman for your thoughts. And let's start, shall we, Lucy, with the, uh, the Metro, um, the IT fiasco, as they put it, at air traffic control, and their assessment of what it's going to cost us all. Yes, it is a whopping £80 billion bill they put on the disruption from a mere four-hour um, computer glitch to the national air traffic system in the UK, which has led to 300,000 passengers being stranded. There are planes, crews, uh, and, of course, um, passengers stuck all over um, the place on the wrong side of the world. And this is disruption that could last for weeks. Uh, I'm not surprised that uh, Mark Harper, the transport secretary, has suggested this is the worst disruption to airline passengers in a decade. And that Downing Street um, has now also weighed in to uh, urge airlines to uh, fulfil their duties to stranded passengers. There's been complaints in the last 24 hours about the behaviour and conduct of some airlines in particular, um, arbitrarily refunding um, airline tickets and leaving passengers to try and find their own way home. Um, but clearly this is a, a, a chaotic incident that's going to impact on uh, many thousands of people for days, if not weeks to come. Yes, we'll come to what Nat said earlier today, issuing a statement, and I spoke to the chief executive. But first of all, let's focus on the passengers, uh, which the I does, Jenny. UK Airlines accused of abandoning passengers. Um, you know, it's not the airline's fault, but it is about communication at this stage, isn't it? Yes, I mean, it isn't the airline's fault. The airlines are, are under obligations to refund passengers when it is their fault. But, you know, as in events of volcanoes, extreme weather, this doesn't, this isn't something that, that they can avoid. Many of them have been uh, providing hotels and, and vouchers wherever possible. But there are people who will be missing out on work. How are they going to get that refunded? There will be people who have missed holidays or weddings, huge, huge things. So there is a kind of blame game of, of who, who is going to be uh, responsible and, you know, this backlog, I mean, we're so sick of this word backlog. We know backlogs in the NHS, backlogs in the Home Office uh, processing asylum claims. There has been year upon year of, of, of crises for the aviation industry. It's not COVID or strikes, it is now this. And what is so interesting in all of this for me is the extent to which it shows how dependent we are on technology, on semi-autonomous um, algorithms, when they fail, obviously there is a backup and it can be done manually, but it, in, it results in weeks, potentially, of disruption uh, for travellers. Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary, allowing flights to uh, take off at night in, in an unusual step, uh, you know, expanding the time in which flights can, um, can be in British airspace. But um, this is a disaster, really, and it, it does beg lots of questions of how can something like this happen and bring aviation to its knees and, and leave so many people 
out of pocket and out of place. Yes, and the Nats boss, um, Lucy, suggesting to me earlier, uh, this is Martin Rolfe, whose uh, salary, in fact, is uh, on the front page of The Sun. He did say that, actually, a single flight plan misfiled by an airline, he would not say it was the French airline that many of the newspapers had earlier reported, um, could actually have caused this. So that, I mean, to me, that's extremely worrying, that a single misfiled flight plan could actually cause disruption to, as, as you said earlier, 300 thousand passengers well i think that's absolutely right it is a marvel in some senses that this hasn't happened uh, before if that is what uh, the invest investigation that's now happening um, by the civil aviation authority uh, into this debacle finds to have been the case when this first uh, arose um, yesterday, uh, there was lots of sort of concern about whether this um, was a cybersecurity incident, some kind of hacking by a you know foreign, a hostile power. You know, Downing Street's made clear today it is believed to be a technical issue, not a cybersecurity issue. Uh, and as you say, Anna, you know, a lot of um, uh, askance looks at the French uh, over these reports that it is a French airline that uh, misfiled the international format for uh, landing in uh, dispatch that is usually used uh, by air traffic control systems, which then led to this chaos and for uh, all the data to be put input manually, but led to at least 280 flights having to be grounded uh, both in the UK and overseas. Mm, OK, and what happens next? Well, he said there's already been changes, uh, uh, Martin Rolfe. Obviously, the Civil Aviation Authority is investigating, reporting to the Transport Secretary. This cannot happen again. No. But does it make a cyber attack more likely? Because how quickly it topples over? Who needs a cyber attack if you can have potentially <laughs> one misfiled, you know, the wrong aviation code can, can mean a four hour outage or six hour outage. I mean, we had, there was some backup so that we could operate for, for a while, but you, know, you don't need cyber security threats if it can simply be a uh, human error or somebody putting a wrong co code in. This really mustn't happen. Uh, the the uh, transport secretary is going to have a report into this apparently on his desk next week. In a way, it's a good thing, actually, that this has happened not, by all accounts, because of... By a, a bad actor. A bad actors yeah. or, 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 you know, people who, who wish to undermine us, because it shows the vulnerability in our system. But as we rely more and more on autonomous systems, on, on AI, this is one of the things that, uh, you know, sceptics about AI warn about. We become so incredibly dependent on machines to do things for us that tiny glitches like this can, can bring us all to a standstill. Yeah, one of your specialist areas, of yes. course. Um, moving on, though, to The Guardian, uh, James Cleverly um, arriving in China. Uh, first visit for some years. What was the problem? Hong Kong, etc. Well, look, I think there's, uh, yes, yeah, certainly question marks about uh, why there hasn't been uh, a visit uh, before now of someone of uh, James Cleverley's uh, status. He is the most senior British official to travel to China since the pandemic. There have been tensions, you know, the uh, the golden age, uh, as David Cameron and George Osborne liked to call it, of Sino-English uh, relations or Sino-UK relations of the coalition era have long since passed with um, China hawks putting a lot of pressure on the British government to take a more robust line on Beijing uh, and the government having to try and walk a tightrope between engaging with China on global challenges like climate change, uh, Ukraine, trade, of course, China so key to so many global supply lines. And on the other hand, recognising where China poses uh, what the government likes to call a sy systemic competition uh, to the UK and what, you know, more plain speaking MPs like to call a threat. Uh, and in particular, protecting industries um, that are critical to national infrastructure. So there's been, uh, I think, this period of evolution of the UK's approach to China. But tomorrow will be a very big moment when James Cleverly sits down with Wang Yi, um, a diplomat who is, you know, a chief proponent of China's wolf warrior style diplomacy, um, who takes quite an aggressive hardline uh, stance towards the West. Um, nonetheless, this will be a, a key moment in trying to warm up relations that have been distinctly cool in the past couple of years. Yes, and if we look, Jenny, at that, you know, the headline in The Guardian, Britain must take China's human rights abuses seriously, uh, according to MPs. And we've heard all of that before, haven't we? But the bottom line is the acceptance that a titan of trade on China's scale cannot be ignored. Absolutely. I mean, this particular headline is to do with a Foreign Affairs Select Committee report, which is coming out tomorrow. That timing is potentially difficult for James Clever 
cleverly in what is perhaps uh, the biggest diplomatic challenge of, of his career. It's a very delicate balancing act to be able to give the impression that Britain is cooperating when it comes to uh, climate change or uh, stance on, on Ukraine, but is also being robust when it comes to human rights abuses and also uh, China, China's belligerent stance with Taiwan. These are very delicate uh, things to balance. And whether or not China is going to care about the Foreign Select Committee uh, publishing a report that's critical of it remains to be seen. Mm. Um, to your byline in the Financial Times, Lucy, uh, Brexit, dare we mention its name, um, and uh, the way that we uh, bring in uh, food and fresh products, what's happened now? Well, Anna, there has been a fifth delay to the implementation of new border controls on food and fresh produce coming from the EU into the UK uh, amid uh, concerns in Treasury quarters about the inflationary impact uh, on, uh, of this new border regime that the UK is looking to introduce. I think a really interesting moment today is that the Cabinet Office um, has admitted that um, it is actually likely to push up the price of food. It insists that this will be a minor impact. It estimates that it will be uh, you know, less than 0.2% uh, across uh, three years that it pushes the headline rate of inflation up by. But nonetheless, uh, at a time of a cost of living crisis, I think that will be a, a worry to many people. I think we also must just say a quick word that, of course, um, checks on UK uh, fresh produce coming from going from Britain into the EU, has faced stringent checks since January 2021. So the delay to those checks being implemented the other way, while uh, you know many traders have asked for more time to prepare for the border regime coming in in the UK, it has been a source of fury to UK farmers who point out that they're not um, on a level playing field with their European competitors when it comes to importing and exporting. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it, Jenny? You know, the questions why the UK might have worse inflation than other parts of the yes. European Union. Not all of it, obviously, and, and nothing like Turkey, as we've seen. Um, but certainly the tight labour market is one, and friction at the border has been another, even though this is not being implemented properly on, on certain sections of our economy. I mean, this is interesting, though, because we all knew that Brexit wasn't necessarily about the economy. I remember being here years ago and people saying, it's not, it doesn't matter Every if we're... Night, if we, yeah, exactly, <laughs> that's what it was. Um, it doesn't matter if we're worse off. This is about bigger things than, than just the economy. But this is interesting because this is the first time the government is actually ad admitting the, the costs of Brexit. And yes, they say that it's, it's 0.2% inflationary rise, but nonetheless, it, it represents a kind of turning point, really, where the government is saying, yeah, we're, we're having to pay a little bit more for doing this. OK, Lucy, Jenny, stay there, both of you. Plenty more still to come in the next part of our programme, including uh, the funeral for anti-Putin mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, has, we're told, taken place. So what next for Russia and, indeed, the war in Ukraine? Back in a moment. It's just an absolutely extraordinary narrative arc. You know, the curbside hot dog seller who's promoted to Kremlin caterer, then takes on, uh, builds up, founds and builds up the biggest private military company in the world, mounts an abortive coup against uh, Moscow and then is quite literally blown out of the sky. It is the stuff of Hollywood blockbusters um, rather than real life uh, for most of the developed world. But we know that Russia is a gangster state. Um, I think, as you say, it's sort of uh, hard, to, um, hard to know why the, the funeral today was quite so uh, low-key, uh, as you point out, Jenny. But clearly, um, Putin is someone who likes to uh, serve revenge cold. Uh, I think there's a great line from the CIA director, William Burns, that Putin is the ultimate apostle of the payback. Mm. Uh, and uh, certainly that seems to be the case here, that uh, certainly seems there was some Kremlin involvement or at least permissibility to uh, the explosion that led to the plane being um, quite literally falling out of the sky last week. Yes. And can I stay with you, Lucy, as a, as a Whitehall editor, uh, front page of the Daily Express, picking up on this story about rivers and home building and a Brexit dividend with it, the idea of nitrates and phosphates being pummeled into the water, our waterways, etc. You know, how, how awkward is this for the government, um, who, after the sewage outflow overflow issue, could be seen as a party not caring about our waterways in this country? Yes, it's interesting take from the Express on this issue, um, trying to uh, frame it as a positive development that Rishi Sunak is uh, now free to uh, abandon uh, environmental protections mandated by the EU that the Express 
frames as being excessive and blocking um, home building uh, by developers. Uh, I think the campaigners, the green campaigners, got out ahead of this story on Sunday night uh, and um, uh, sorry on Monday night uh, and today to argue that actually this is yet another way in which you know Britain's waterways are being damaged by government policy after. Uh, you know, the real scandal of what has happened with sewage flowing into rivers, into sea, into swimming spots in recent years, and the, the rows back and forth with the water companies about the level of investment that they've made into storm uh, outflows, the claims and counterclaims about whether this is to do with the infrastructure in the UK being outdated. But uh, I think uh, certainly this will be um, one of the dividing lines of the next election, the green issues. Uh, and for many people who don't want to see extra costs put on their energy bills when it comes to um, wider climate goals. I think there is something really visceral about the pollution uh, of British waterways that uh, the government might find itself on the wrong side of. Yes. We're we just going to end um, with the Daily Star. Um, rather disappointing news for all of us who happen not to look like Brad Pitt. Boffins say beer goggles don't work. Well, there wasn't much to go on in this short paragraph, so I looked it up, Jenny, and there was an article from February 2020 which said scientists prove beer goggles really exist <laughs> as booze can level the playing field. Oh um, good news, they say, for beauties and the beast. So, in 10 seconds, we're confused. I love the fact that you come to me for these stories. You come to Lucy <laughs> for all the important stuff. Yeah, uh, apparently, we, we, the jury is still out of whether or not uh, drinking... Oh. Uh, makes makes your standards go lower i think that's what it's about when it comes anyway i give up if anybody understands this please let me know okay <laughs> jenny and uh, lucy